Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Russ Angold. Russ is an entrepreneur, uh, one of the founders of Exobionics, and an all-around great guy. Russ, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me, Spencer. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate yeah. you making it. Yeah, absolutely. Should be uh, should be exciting. I'm, I'm looking forward to see what kind of questions you got for me. Yeah, uh, let's just jump right in then, why don't we? Um, so what I guess caused you to found uh, Exobionics. That's obviously a company I've been following for a while, and I'm interested to kind of learn the back the backstory. Yeah, yeah, that one's an easy one actually. So um, I come from a family of I have a lot of brothers. I have actually six brothers, and I'm the no sisters. Um, oh wow! So the uh, I'm the third in line, and my brother that's just older than me. He uh, we're the closest in age. We're 18 months apart, and so. Um, we both, you know, played football together in high school and, you know, we were best buds and he was going to go to the Coast Guard Academy, ended up, you know, he wanted, really wanted to be a Navy SEAL and went to the Naval Academy and uh, he was playing football there. And I got recruited to go play football at West Point and, and other places. We were both pretty good football players. And uh, <laughs> he came home winter break of his freshman year at the Naval Academy, which is his plebe year and told me what life was like at the academy and you know i said, I said well i have a problem with authority so um <laughs> you, you go be a navy seal and you know i always knew from it like the by the time i was my parents knew before i knew that i was going to be an engineer because every toy they'd buy me i'd tear it apart and try to figure out how it worked or make nice. it better or do whatever and uh so i said you go be a navy seal i'll be an engineer and somehow I'll figure out a way to make you guys cool shit. and so uh, flash forward to 2004, and he was a Navy SEAL over in Virginia Beach. And um, a former colleague of mine, Nate Harding, one of the other co-founders of EXO, he called me up. And he said, "Hey, we're working on this project at UC Berkeley. It's a DART. It was part of the DARPA project back then, the Bleaks Exoskeleton Project." And he showed me this video um, of this, you know, big hydraulic exoskeleton walking around and. Uh, with Adam and I didn't know Adam at the time, but I know Adam now nice. Adam walked around in this thing and I was like, Oh my God, that's so cool. And he said, yeah, we're looking to do another rev of it. You know, you want to come up and help. And I was like, Oh, absolutely. This is it. Like I can go, you know, do what I said, help my brother. This is for the soldiers. The whole point was to, to reduce the injuries uh, that soldiers were suffering due to overburdening and load carriage, right. With all the body armor and the gear they're carrying. Yeah. So I said, yeah. So it was kind of a, uh, diving in head first without checking the water kind of moment. I just looked <laughs> at the video and said, wow, that, that looks cool. I'm in. And so literally gave my notice and went up to Berkeley to start working on the project. Cool. Yeah. What did you give notice from at the time? Like what were you, what were you doing before that? Oh, so, uh, at that time I was working at Rainbird sprinklers doing new product development. Oh, cool. So, I'm so I'm a weird duck. So my background is actually in agricultural engineering. So I ended up deciding not to play football in college because I just gotten too beat up in uh, high school. And I had grown like I was a man child. By the time I was in eighth grade, I weighed 185 pounds. Oh, wow. By the time I graduated high school, I was like 215. So I haven't grown That's at all awesome. since basically <laughs> I was a freshman in high school. But I knew that like everybody else is still growing. I'm like, I'm this is it. This is the thing <laughs> I'm going to get. So like I'm, I'm not good enough to be a professional football player. I really want to focus on school. I'm tired of getting hurt. So uh, I ended up going down to Cal Poly and uh, San Luis Obispo. And I was going to do mechanical engineering, but my high school ag teacher said, well, you should check out agricultural engineering, which I had no idea what that was at the time. And so um, I went down to tour the campus, toured the mechanical engineering department. Then I went and toured the uh, Cal Poly's well, now it's called the Bio Resource and Agricultural Engineering Department. Anyways, I went and toured that, and I'll never forget. I rounded the corner, and they had this row of shops from a wood shop, metal shop, 
water labs, like That's all this stuff and all these projects out that all these students were building. And I talked with one of the professors, Dr. Mark Zons, and told him what was going on. Like I was thinking about mechanical engineering. He said, well, the cool thing about this major is you can do that. You can be a mechanical engineer. So I'm a licensed mechanical engineer, even though I did agri engineering. We do all the same course curriculum, but you also add in a bunch of civil stuff, a bunch of water stuff, all geared towards making a like a like a well round like the Swiss Army knife of engineers for the ag community. That's cool. And, and yeah, like so a robotics really, degree. <laughs> yeah, so it was really cool. Um, I mean, we don't dive as deep in the stuff. Like we did a bunch of SCADA stuff. Like so, I don't know if you guys even heard about SCADA, but it's like how you control like water districts and all their. Well, let's. So I don't I, know about that. Is it it's like, like a lot of PLC logic, okay. right? Yeah, that makes um, sense. Big SCADA systems, supervised and control and data acquisition for like energy grids, water districts. So, I mean, it's it's not really robotic programming. We did a lot of, uh, my, my focus was on that more on the mechanics side. So anyways, out of college, Nate actually, who was the co-founder of EXO, he hired me out of Cal Poly. And we had this connection where, um, <laughs> I've got to tell you the interview story. The interview story was the best. So uh, I submit my resume for this uh, automation company up in the Bay Area, right? And uh, he calls me. Uh, I get a phone call or I had a phone interview with him scheduled. So I literally call him from one of the shops because we were working on some project. And uh, he asked me a bunch of, you know, engineering questions and we're going through it. And then he asked this one question, which was, you know, how do you make an internal keyway? In a you know a hole in an internal keyway. Oh, right? interesting. So how do you know? Brooch, I would think. Yeah, right. So you use a keyway brooch, right? Everyone keyway brooch. Yeah. Yeah. So that was first answer, keyway brooch. And he's like, okay, how else do you make one? And I, I mean, was you like, could oh. mill and use a pen. Sorry, I shouldn't keep answering the question. No, no. I mean, you could think about it. Like, <laughs> it's hard to use a mill because you got to go in the hole. Like, how do you do it? Like, how do you get an actual square? Slot? Well, no, I was and thinking so, if you used a round pen, you could use that as a key, but it would be kind of improvised. Yeah. Yeah. You get the radius. So anyways, yeah. I'm standing there. Luckily I'm standing there in the shop in my coveralls, right? Dirty working on stuff. And I just start looking around the shop and we have this old shaper. <laughs> I was like, Oh, I guess you could use a shaper, right? Cause the shaper just, just uh, pushes the cutting tool in a straight line. So oh, you cool. could put that right in the middle. And, and he's like, dude, nobody ever gets the shaper. Like he was so fired up. I was like, All right. So that was a good enough answer to get a, to get a, a on-campus interview. So when he was down, I think I was the last interview of the day. Um, definitely the only ag engineer he ended up hiring, um, or the only one he had an interview with. But um, at the end of that, we going through the interview, we realized that he used to work in the speed shop as a kid in, in Texas, working on these old Allison aircraft engines. Like somebody brought one in for a hot rod. So it's a oh, cool. old 1710 Allison aircraft engine that used to be in the P-51As, p 38 P-39s. Oh, wow. Well, my buddies and I had ended up putting one in a tractor for our senior level mechanical <laughs> design class project. We made a 1400 horsepower tractor pulling That's tractor. Awesome. And so I got to take him down to the shop and show him and start it. So we, from, the, from there on out, we were friends. But imagine the drive shaft would become the failure point on something with that much horsepower. Yeah. And unfortunately it's, it sits about two inches from your nuts. Like right <laughs> <under the street. laughs> That's so, fucking terrifying. <laughs> yeah. And I think they had, I think that thing has like, over 2,000 foot pounds of torque. So the drive line was oh, a geez. solid drive line. And then we built a big uh, 3 8 metal shroud good. as a protection. All right. Well, then uh, you're good. As a, yeah. Well, if you hear the ding, you, you got 3 8 <laughs> You hope. Hopefully, yeah. steel. <laughs> yeah. Never broke a drive line. No. Yeah. But yeah. So that's where Nate and I uh, hit it off. So then I worked up in the Bay Area automation. This is uh, what, 2000. So we were there for a couple of years together. And then uh, our biggest customer at the time was Lucent Technology. We were making a bunch of, um, we made a bunch of semiconductor equipment, some crazy automation stuff. And then um, Lucent Technologies was our biggest customer making uh, optical fiber winders. So how do you make the optical fiber? Um, and then I don't remember if you, you remember the Lucent crash in 2002, three. I don't somewhere around that. there. What, what happened there? Uh, basically the industry realized they could do multi-mode, uh, transmission across fiber. So they didn't need as much fiber oh, right? it's brutal. Expensive to lay fiber. And so they are like, Hey, we can actually like multiplex this and like feed every frequency down one single fiber <laughs> and you, like get, you know, a hundred times gain for each piece of fiber. And it was like, we don't got to put any more fiber in the ground. And so like literally when's the last time you saw someone putting fiber in the ground? 
in the used ground, to see it a lot uh, in the d- early 2000s. I don't think that I can remember. Right. I've so, run it in buildings since then as part of an IT job, <laughs> but that's yeah. not the ground. But you don't see it getting, you know, remember all those horizontal boring machines putting it everywhere? So that put an end to that. So anyways, when that stopped, I ended up, and there was the whole downturn of the economy. So I ended up going down to, to Rainbird to put my ag engineering degree to use. And I wanted to get into more high volume manufacturing just to see what that space was like. So a lot of injection molded plastic parts, like you're making all these assemblies and they, you know, if you're making a sprinkler, it's got to cost nothing. So like your bombs were like 47 cents for 15 parts and that included metal and springs. Oh, wow. And, yeah. How do you get so, your cost down that low? Just scale? Scale. Well, yeah. they, they have an interesting model where, you know, like, they once they make a product, they end up selling that same product for like 30, 40 years. Like it's the same sprinkler oh, wow. that was 50 years ago. So when you do the tooling, like they'll invest like five million dollars in super high cap. How long to tool. break even in that industry on the tooling? That's like a couple of years. Oh, okay. Like just, wow. All right. So you're printing money at that point. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's awesome. They print money. It's like design a product. And that's where that's where I kind of got disheartened where I I spent this um I don't know, it was, it was like six months or seven months on this cool project that turned your sprinklers into like the Bellagio fountains. So your cool. sprinklers would basically turn off and on. And the whole idea was to eliminate runoff. So like your spray heads put down too much water. Like the, the typical spray head puts down an inch and a half of water per hour, which is for most soils, unless you're in Florida and you live in sand, is too much for the ground to soak up. And so the whole idea was to turn the turn the spray head on for one second and off for two seconds completely passive just a loss motion piston so you're mechanism. basically just trying to have the output so that you know you have less water coming out yeah we thirded one oh, okay. third of the output. cool and so it was cool so we did all this stuff and you turn your sprinklers on it literally like your spray heads would just be randomly turning off and on it looked really cool that sounds like fun uh, yeah so I went through this whole project and at the end of it i remember going through the design review and as part of the project i had to redesign one of their pressure regulators because um, it wouldn't fit with the other parts I wanted to put in the four inch stem. And when I did that, I eliminated a couple parts and combined some parts and ma- ended up making that pressure rig that it cheaper. And at the end of the whole design review, they're like, well, new product adoption is really hard in this industry. Ah. But cost savings make sense. And so like literally they only went with the cost savings product. And I was like, well, that sucks. Like <laughs> I wanted to do the cool new product. So, you know, that had just happened. Then I got the call from Nate. And I was like, all right, time to move on. So you didn't get to make the Bellagio fountain one? Like you never tooled up for that? Nope, never. We had, we, we tooled up for production runs. We had test sites around California. We were running them. I think I still have some of them. They're really cool. And you could use them. That sounds you like a actually, mechanical multiplexer. Like I'm really curious how you did that, to be honest. Yeah, it was basically a little lost motion piston assembly with a couple springs and pistons that would fill and discharge. But if you got rid of the spray head and put like a nozzle on it, it literally, you could have those, you know, those chasing fountains you see at like the amusement parks. Yeah. yeah. All you need is a hose hooked to it, constant pressure. And it turns into those chasing fountains. Oh, that's just awesome. Because it turns on immediately and then and, and slams off. Like it was pretty cool. Or you could use it for shower heads, right? Reduce water use in your shower. Cause yeah. when it's on, you get full flow. When it's off, you get zero flow. But for that to work, wouldn't you have to have like three shower heads in your shower or am I, am I mistaken? Yeah, well, you could do like two and try to like pulse modulate how much water you were using so that you got full flow for a period of the time, but not all the time, right? So instead <laughs> of having like, right, think about it that way. Like it's either reduce the water uh, the water amount and get less water pressure all the time or have full water pressure. Like if you pulse it fast enough, you'd have full water pressure for, let's say, uh, like a 60% duty cycle. Oh, that would be pretty cool if you could actually pull that. Well, I think you see that, right? There's pulse shower heads so yeah you would just right, get the time right. they right. have like the massage shower heads yeah so exactly. maybe cut water yeah there's nothing worse than a weak shower head yeah, yeah. That, that's not yeah. what you want at all no but then i would imagine like a one second frequency would also suck because you know you're showering oh crap okay <laughs> yeah that'd be too long it also yeah. causes water hammer so you need uh like what's water hammer? water hammer is uh when you shut a valve off i don't know if you've ever heard it in like an old house or pipe or if you uh if you have a bunch of you basically have a ton of momentum right because you have water flowing in a pipeline that's mass and it's moving if you slam a valve that mass backs up and water's incompressible so you get these huge pressure spikes oh that makes so sense it's, 
So like uh, they sell devices that you put like on your washer and dryer where it's got a little, um, it's almost like a hydraulic accumulator. Yeah, it makes sense. So you have like a spring where it can absorb those pressure spikes. Otherwise you have to run the risk of blowing up pipes, which I did a project in college where uh, I blew up a quarter mile of low pressure concrete pipeline. <laughs> <laughs> it On wasn't purpose my, or unintentionally? No, it was, it was, uh, I think it was my, that was my senior that was my senior design project. So not mechanical concrete. We had a senior project and I had built these um, flow control valves for a district out in the Valley of California where, uh, so typically the California Valley has been flood irrigation and the way they, they, the way they give them water is uh, the farmer will call the water district, say, Hey, I need so many acre feet of water. So at a rate, right and how much and for how long. And so they have these big stand pipes and they just open a valve and that thing fills up and then they'll open their downstream valves and it's all gravity fed and they'll do like big border strip irrigation. Well, when people started switching over to drip irrigation to use less water, the filter systems for those have a big uh, back flush component. So they'll run water, they'll run constant flow for a while, but then every so often they need to flush the filters. Oh, that's interesting. Back so you, flush you reverse cycle. it in order to get all the crap out of the filter, basically? Or? Yeah, basically you reverse okay. flow through the filter and dump that water out to get the crap out so you don't clog all your emitters. But when you do that, your flow requirements change. But the huh. water district is giving you constant flow water. So like you're getting as much, like they opened a pipe, that amount of that water's coming to you. And if you turn off your, if your filters cut how much water they want, your, your stand pipes, if you've ever driven through the valley, you see all these concrete stand pipes. They're just going to start flow, overflowing with water. So a stand pipe's with. just a, a horizontal or a vertical pipe, rather that like yeah, it's the, like a three foot concrete. I'm picturing pipe. the pipes in Mario Brothers uh, when you're yeah, it looks exactly okay. like that. So exactly <laughs> like Mario Brothers pipe. So uh, that's exactly it. So <laughs> that will fill up with water and just start spilling. So Hilarious. what we did, <laughs> we put a large, a really large toilet valve in these things, so that when the the filters go to back flush, they would it would lift up the 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 valve, right? A big, um, Oh, okay. A big float valve. It's just a big float valve. It what was that closed. connected to, Oh, you're telling me, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's connected to the pipe that feed and it's also an air brake. So, okay. Like so they, if it gets too high, you cut off the inlet is, is kind of the way it works. Yeah, that's it. Okay. It just throttled, it just throttled the flow and they usually want Dude, an that air sounds brake. Good. <laughs> so they have, if you see those pipes, it's like a three foot concrete pipe. And then there's an elbow that comes up and dumps water, but it's usually like a foot above that. And that's to prevent any sort of like reverse backwashing into the system. Like if you had some chemicals or something, they don't want to going back into the piping system and going somewhere else. Right. So they yeah. usually have a, an air break uh, between that. So anyways, one of the farmers wasn't happy and he wanted more water or something while it was back. I don't know what he was doing, but he basically stood on top and top of this float that's hooked to this big butterfly. And these are like 10 inch pipes. Right. So we're talking a lot of flow. And so he's standing on top of this big, I think that thing was like a 12 inch <laughs> weight it down, float, <laughs> standing on it, weighting it down. The thing starts filling up to the point where he can't hold it. Well, then he, he jumps off and it slams the valve shut <laughs> and, and all of that, right. You're only that, that pipeline's only made to carry like what, maybe six PSI of head or eight, 10 PSI. <laughs> No, so I get this phone call like, hey, we just blew up a pipeline. And literally, like they said, you could just see the water start coming out of the ground all the way back <laughs> to the trunk because it just split that concrete pipe like a. What's the like diameter on that pipe? Like, just so I can picture it. Uh, the feed pipe is probably like a, a 12 inch pipe. That's wild. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just split it like no one's business. So from there on out, I, you know. Yes, that wasn't how it was intended to be used. But as an engineer, like I would say that's not out, your fault. I mean, <laughs> well, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't think about it. So from there on out, I put a shock absorber on the uh, on the float valve so that even if somebody stood on it, it could never close fast, like regardless of what they did. Oh, that's it interesting. Could, so if they jumped close. off, it would still close slowly and not blow up a yeah. pipe. Right. Yeah, it makes sense. That's pretty clever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's funny how those things happen. You never really know how something's going to work till you give it to somebody and walk away. Yeah, yeah. What is it? Um, anything that says anything's anyone anyone that says anything's idiot proof undermines or underestimates the ingenuity of idiots. Yeah, mm. like, uh, yep. You yeah. see it all the time. Yep. 
What's a, what's another interesting case of user error, uh, I guess, to call it that, that you've seen in your career? Uh, let's see. I don't know. I have to think about that one. I user got one error. if you want me to interject. Yeah, yeah, go for <laughs> to it. Give you some time to think of something. So yeah. we did a um, robotic catamaran a while ago for water inspection. Um, and we uh, put these shear pins in that were bronze uh, so that you know, if the uh, propellers got stuck on kelp or algae or anything, the pin would shear and it wouldn't yeah. transmit the torque up the drive shaft and break something. Right. Well, um, we had it off the customer. Um, I have no idea when or how or why they did this, but the customer replaces our shear pins, which we gave them spares of with. Um, Metal uh, pin. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, they used um, hardened threaded, you know, like. They cut a yeah. bolt and put it in where the shear pin used to be. Well, they got frustrated so, with shearing the pins. Yeah, evidently. And so, you know, that might have been what happened. And so I um I, I said, Hey, where's the where's the prop on, on the left side of the catamaran? And the guy goes, Bottom of the river. Well, what the hell happened? <laughs> yeah. Apparently yeah. they replaced it with this stuff and it torqued. And uh yeah, yeah the prop just dropped to the bottom of the river. So that was some yeah, service yeah. revenue. It happens all the time. Like I'm a big proponent. I always tell people like um, I'm working on this uh, big machine that puts in solar fields right now. So it oh, cool. puts in piles for solar fields. And uh, oh, when one of the you pile drivers, that's, those are awesome. It's not a pile driver. It's a screw machine. So it puts in uh, ground screws and trusses. So it uses less metal, can go on rougher ground um, and doesn't use, yeah, it doesn't use as much steel as a regular H pile. Um, and it can go in rocky or soils. Like it's hard to drive piles through rocks. So awesome. uh, anyways, we were talking about testing these things. And I'm like, look, if you want to get a good test of anything you're working on, you need to give it to somebody that's not responsible for fixing it. Because <laughs> like, anytime you want to test anything, I don't care if it's a robot, a new new device contraption, whatever it is, you got to give it to somebody that like, you know, is can play with it and do stuff with it with reckless abandon, because that's what your customers are going to do. And that's how you learn. And if you give it to engineers that are going to be responsible for fixing something, if it breaks, they'll never push it as hard as a customer will. Yeah. So you always do that. Yeah. You ever crash a robot through the wall? Uh, not through a wall. Um, <laughs> I, just, I just put two Delta robots on a, uh, on a robot picking line. And um, I guess I didn't constrain it properly in the, the radius. And uh, the, the somehow the camera system would pick up like a target that wasn't on the conveyor. And so it happened twice where the robot tried to go pick up something that wasn't on the conveyor. Oh, like off just, to the side and like, yeah, drove off to the side. Yeah. No, it had its boundary set up and down the conveyor. And I don't even know how it, it picked up the thing that wasn't on the conveyor. <laughs> Wait, it actually was able to drive that far out. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the, I think the operating distance on those things is like, it's like 1.2 meters and I'm oh, on wow. a 36 inch wide. Um, uh, conveyor belt so just slammed it into the side of the and the, the conveyor is not a flat top conveyor it's got rails so just wham and ah, it brutal. happened twice the, the robot the you know kudos to fanic it, it stopped itself and didn't hurt itself but um <laughs> i have it it's cranked all the way up for max speed so uh it was a little terrifying when it did it you're like oh crap Hopefully nothing broke <laughs> yeah i didn't do this but i heard a story about somebody just pushing the limits of uh those UR robots, um, and they were loading a press for a well-known shovel company. And they had these things putting like the piece into the, uh, or it might have been a forge. It was, it was like, uh, no, it was a stamping press. And so they were loading the stamping press and getting out of there and loading the stamping press and getting out of there. And I guess like one joke they had at that, uh, that job site was, you know, ah, it'll buff out. And so yeah. anyway, uh, the UR, like they were pushing the limits of how fast this thing could move. And it didn't clear it in time, and it got pancaked. And my yeah. friend goes, uh, I don't think it'll buff out. <laughs> and the engineer just starts cracking up. He's like, get out of here. <laughs> I can't imagine, like, a big stand. Like, I remember seeing, we did a tour early on at EXO. We did a tour of the Numi plant, which is now the Tesla plant. Oh, cool. Yeah, and uh, that's in Fremont, right? Fremont, yeah. And they had the big stamping facility there. So they were stamping. At the time, they were making... Pontiac Vibes, Toyota Matrixes, and Toyota yeah, Trucks. That's, that's a historic stamping. plant. <laughs> yeah. They were stamping all the sheet metal sides for that. And I'll never forget, like, one, the tools for that they're using, like, to stamp the whole side of a car. It's literally, like, I don't know, like, 10 feet by, like, 5 feet wide. These big tools that are, like, 
I don't know, 16 inches thick, top and bottom, they stick them in there. And they had those transfer robots, right? It was a multi-stage process. And these transfer robots are moving in and out of there while this thing's just continuously cycling. That's these. wild. Wham. 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 And I was literally like, oh my God, what happens when that goes bad? Like, I don't know if you've ever like put a too big of a piece of steel on like a press break or something and blown up a die. Like it's terrifying. <laughs> like that hard, hardened metal when it explodes is terrifying. Um, so they're like, yeah, if it, if they crash, it's, it's pretty catastrophic. That's <laughs> brutal. Like, I've definitely, know. I've, I've, I've gone through one of the, uh, it's not a press break, but I've gone through one of those things that curves metal. I can't remember with like the three rollers. Roller. Yeah. Yeah. I, I put a piece of titanium through one of those in the field robotics center at Carnegie Mellon. And, uh, I guess it was like harder than what those rollers are used to. And it, it shot like 20 feet out of the top when the tension got released on it. Yeah. I still have yeah, it. Though. Like, it curved nice. <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. But yeah, it sprung back hard. <laughs> yeah. That stuff's kind of terrifying. When yeah, for sure. Explode. Yeah. Well, that wasn't even really an explosion. It just was a projectile. So you know, it still, yeah, just still was pretty scary. Up stress. stress with nowhere to go. Yeah, exactly. And a machine shop. I mean, you don't really want to, you know, like that of flying tools is uh, materials kind of a bad, yeah, bad thing. <laughs> and that's probably the most things I've crashed is just, um, I used to have an old two and a half axis CNC mill and you would program it. Is that two axis like, with like a drill press handle or how does that work? Yeah. Yeah. Two, so two, it's like, a, it's like a bridge port with a, a two axis X, Y, and then Z had a DRO on it, but you would manually set your Z. So you could program to make parts but you were in control of Z, oh, right? Cool. And it would you could program it to stop at certain spots and tell you to recycle, you know, cycle Z. So that's for like so drill good. bolt patterns, basically. Yeah, good for bolt patterns, or you could do like pockets and things. Cool. But yeah, all the time you would forget to put like the pause step in, and it would go to do something. Like it would finish doing like a pocket, and then like the next step was to go drill a hole. Oh no! But you never <laughs> you never put the pause in to like yeah. tell you to pick Z up. So it'd be like, click, get to the center of the pocket. It's all done and just like wrap it over across and you <laughs> shoot tools off. You know, like, oh. <laughs> so yeah, that thing was, that thing was dangerous because it wasn't fully automated and it was easy to screw up. Uh, brutal. Yeah. I remember um, also in the field robotics center, like seeing um, a half inch data flute crash into a table clamp. Like that was pretty, uh, yeah. I mean, it wasn't horrible because the guards were closed, but it was still like, you know, ah, there goes, you know, a lot of money for a student. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. A hundred bucks Sparks, or something. Sparks flying. Yeah, Sparks exactly. Flying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that's uh, that you, you don't forget when you make those kind of mistakes. That's how you learn. Yeah. And I feel like anytime a shop master is like telling you how to do something and they're like, don't do it this way. It's because they screwed up and, and broke the thing. And like, oh, that's absolutely. not what they don't tell you that part. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. The other funny part about that shop training is uh, Chuck Whitaker is the guy that ran that shop. I think he probably still does. Red Whitaker's brother. Okay. And he um, he would talk about how you're not supposed to use the shop like under the influence of like you know anything. And he's like, I've never actually caught anyone in here under the influence of drugs or alcohol, but I've caught a lot of people under the influence of sleep deprivation. <laughs> yeah. So you know he and he's I'm like, what do you do if you catch somebody? He's like, I send them home. I'm like, in their car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, Tell them to sleep it off. Is that just as bad. <laughs> yeah. 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 Shops are, yeah. We used to, well, when we were building that tractor, we had a lot of late nights. We'd get the campus police would show up at the shop at three in the morning. Like, what are you guys doing? And we'd that's be there just normal. <laughs> yeah. They're like, hey, we got to get this thing done, man. We got whatever, three weeks left to finish it. Like, it's got to get done. Yeah. Red Bull and, uh, you know, whatever other energy drinks you can find at that point, you know. That and Rob cranking. Zombie cranking on the uh, speakers. We did a lot of Pink Floyd <laughs> in the FRC. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that yeah, good time. <laughs> all good memories. I, I oh, enjoy sure. that. Like, I always enjoy like the the scrum or those moments in time where you have a deadline and you know it's not like we're going to be working this hard for a year, but it's like, hey, there's going to be this three week period where you're not going to get a whole lot of sleep and we're going to crank and kick ass and you can get a lot done. It's amazing. Yeah, well, I feel like you really get to know people during those times too. Like the, the people yeah. that are there with you, uh, those are like, you always know you can rely on the folks that, that survive that kind of crucible, like alongside right. you. Right. Yeah. And if you can, um, I also, I don't know what, what, I don't even know what year that was. There was a stint where I did, uh, I was a judge on junkyard wars. Oh, that's awesome. I, I did not know you did that. 
Yeah, I was. A, it was the car dozing episode. That was one of my favorite then, shows as a kid. I wonder if I saw you on there and like don't even remember it. That's that's so cool. Maybe it was that, and then I did Monster Garage too. Nice. Uh, we built we built the tree shaker, and uh, the Junkyard Wars one. Was I was like a little disenfranchised because it was like they had a whole extra day to make everything work. Oh, right? so Hollywood, yeah. Like things were kind of planted, right? They kind of had a plan ahead of time, and they kind of. That kind of makes sense. Like the kind of shit they find in that junkyard. It's like, there's no fucking way. Like intact hydraulic cylinders on a garbage truck. Come on. Right, right, right. Like everything just works. Right, right, right. So a little bit of Hollywood to make it show up. But we did have. uh, I mean, to be fair, it's probably a better show than it would be if nothing actually ran. (laughs) Oh, yeah, absolutely. And in all fairness, like the. So you have the build day, which is film. Then you have the second day to like try to prepare for the that's not film so you try to film or get the the vehicles enough or ready enough to try to make it through the trials that are going to be the next day and then the next day is the trial well on our next day the one team the motor blew like first pass right Ah. it was it was like a 350 or something and it was down in like uh simi valley somewhere there's a ton of junkyards and so literally just started calling around found an old 350 and you know (laughs) Yeah, like every, it was like all hands on deck to swap out that motor. So like the other teams probably yeah. helped at that point, I'm guessing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Everybody was helping yeah, at that it's point. It's like battle bots. <laughs> thing swapped out so we at least, you know, continue on with the show. But so it was like, you know, that was real junk air wars. It was like, oh, crap, the engine just blew up. We got to go find another one. We got to get it swapped out and get it back up and running. Did they show it blowing up on the show or did thing. they just get rid of that footage altogether? It's like it never happened. No, they kept it. They were worried about shadowing because it was taking time. So they're like, people might notice like the first run to the second run, right? Might like, because it might be two hours or three hours later by the time you got the engine swap. Yeah. That they'll notice that the sun has changed enough between those two shots. They were able so, to get yeah. the engine swapped in three hours, like from sourcing to like new engine. And like, oh, yeah. That's why. Absolutely. Yeah, well, we'll go to like a my my son was just at the, the top fuel drag races here in Sonoma. I don't know if you've ever been to a top fuel drag race. No, not yet. Okay, so it's the one sport I recommend, like especially if you're an engineer. If there's you, something like, going while I'm in California, <laughs> oh, it's gone. It, it was out. this weekend. Ah, brutal. But the, uh, that's the one. Mo- well, I haven't been in an F1 race, so I want to go to an F1 race. That seems like fun. The I top like that field dragsters. Hot. The top field dragsters, like you have to go see it in person because you have no no idea on TV. How, one, how loud they are, and two, how fast that is. Right? They go from zero to 300 plus miles an hour in a thousand feet wow a thousand feet and, and that crap. all happens in like four seconds that's like or, faster or, than a chiron oh yeah yeah, yeah like, that's like, wild like, like way faster yeah. yeah so um it's just mind-boggling like seeing like physics in action it's it's it's, it's incredible and it's, it's so just loud a straight like, line I, race i'm guessing like there's not going to be cornering at those speeds oh no, no no it's just straight line it used to be a quarter they used to race a quarter mile but they go they go started going so fast they cut it down to a thousand feet to keep them from going so fast so these things <laughs> how really fast did they out. used to go if they're over 300 miles an hour already they're going like 320 330 oh, wow. like it was going too fast like and if something goes wrong like your shoots don't come out like it's really hard to stop yeah that uh, makes sense yeah. Miles an hour. Probably gonna so anyways, die. it's so loud. Like if I was, if we were sitting here or if we did this show yesterday, I'm probably, I don't know, 17, 18 miles away from the track. I can hear <laughs> them here. I can hear them in my house. That's wild. Every, from 18 like, miles away. 18 miles away. You hear the whole house goes for four seconds and then disappears. And you wait a couple minutes and then you hear the next pass. So the it's whole crazy. run is four seconds long and they get up to that speed. That's, that's insane. Yeah. yeah. It's, they, they put out like, and there's a human in this thing. <laughs> yeah. I think they, I think they hit like through over three G's when they're accelerating. Um, that's like wild. off the line, they hit three G's. Is there a risk of passing out at that, at that uh, acceleration? I wonder, like you're, you're getting there. I feel like, oh, wow, it's so fast. Like yeah. three seconds. Like you, you don't have enough time for your blood to go away. <laughs> Do people wear so, G suits or like how do they compensate for that? I don't know. There's yeah, practice. Yeah, you gotta get you gotta get like certified as you start going faster that you can handle it. But the um but the point was that those guys rebuild their motors every run. So they, <laughs> they tear the entire engine apart. Like they might say if the, if they didn't blow a piston or a crank, they'll 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 rebuild the heads. The, the clutch is a one time use clutch. Holy shit. 
same kind of clutch we use in the tractors, this big five disc crower clutch. So what people don't realize is they five disc. Wait, what does that look like? It's five disc okay. and five intermediate plates stacked together. That's wild. And so the way it works is the engine makes, you know, whatever they're making nowadays, 12, 14,000 horsepower, one engine, 14,000. Yeah. Holy thousand shit. horsepower nitromethane. So the, the gas pedal is like a switch. So it's as fast as they can hit that switch off when they're like, it's just, green. it's just a binary. It's either on or off. It's either on or off. Fuck me. So the, the engine makes the whole horsepower. And I think there's some crazy stat, like the, the engine only turns like 180 times. It's like 180 rotations or less, like 80 rotations in one pass. So it's geared up is what it's gotta be to hit those speeds. Maybe. Well, so the clutch slips the entire race. Like maybe at the end, the, the clutch actually uh, hooks up completely. <laughs> so if you looked at it, if you looked at a so graph, <laughs> yeah, if you looked at a graph of like horsepower to to like horsepower of the engine to horsepower Versus the on the ground, ground. <laughs> yeah, it just sits there and slowly they can slowly add more horsepower. And hopefully at the end, they might be fully locked so up. So that's why but you need those five discs, because if you only had one, it would just explode and nothing would happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It would just melt, right? Yeah, that's that why sense. they crash it after <laughs> each race, because there's like literally 14,000 horsepower times three seconds. That's your accelerator is the clutch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so like half that horsepower goes to actually accelerating the car. You can't the use a torque converter to like an automatic? Like there's got to be... I well, guess. you don't have any time. It's so fast. Yeah. You can't shift. Right. Yeah, so they realized sense. way back when, like you can't shift a gear, like you don't have time to shift gears. So yeah. just make so much horsepower that you have way too much and then let it slip all the way down the track. That's wild. <laughs> I mean, the, the name of the game is trying to put as much horsepower as you can to the ground. That's why you'll see them, you know, they'll get halfway down the track and all of a sudden smoke their tires because they let too much clutch out too soon for the track. So they do have control over the clutch. Like that's, that's a yeah, but the a driver vehicle. doesn't. It's a it's on it's on timers. So it's oh, basically interesting. they have a so an air cylinder that's slowly letting the clutch out on a prescribed timeline huh. to try to maximize how much torque they're putting down the track. And yeah, that's it's based cool. off of when you first hit that on off accelerator. That starts the timer, right? And then you're just kind of along for the ride. The driver's a passenger, not really a driver at that point. Yeah, well, they're steering it because like, it's they, like you're in a spacecraft. Okay, wait. No. Yeah, yeah, they seriously are, and like the exhaust, like so they'll lose cylinders going down the track, and if you lose a cylinder, like just the amount of force that you lose coming out of the exhaust pipe will cause the car to steer. Because that's they, wild. They literally have yeah, it's a V8 and you have eight jets and you'll see, a, you know, a, a, one of their cylinders go out and just start spitting raw fuel. But then all of a sudden you don't have as much thrust on that side. Oh, that's <laughs> it. So you're actually getting thrust from. Yeah. yeah. And I'm uh, guessing there's no, no silencer on it. It's just, you know. Oh, no. yeah. No. <laughs> no. No, I don't know how you could silence it. But yeah, yeah it's pretty spectacular. It's, it's really cool. Like if any gearheads or people that like mechanics go, like you can watch them rebuild these things in the pit. You can see them. You can get close to it. It's like a super cool event. Like I highly recommend it. That sounds like Especially a blast. What, what is this kids called again? Engineering. What's that? What, what's the name of the event? One more time. Uh, NHRA drag race, top fuel drag racing, top fuel drag racing. Okay. Yeah. That yeah. sounds like a blast. Yeah. It's super cool. Yeah, It just sounds bonkers over the top. Amazing. Like, like, yeah, it's like the nuttiest thing you'll ever see. It's probably the loudest thing you'll ever, like, it's so loud. If you're standing near the starting line, it's not like, like you have to earplugs in, you have to plug your ears, but then it's so loud that it shakes your eyeballs. Like you literally can't focus. Like your your whole body shakes and your eyeballs, like literally your your vision goes blurry because it's that loud. That's wild. It's, it's bonkers. Yeah, that, that just sounds like fun. Yeah, it's similar vein to like a demolition jer derby or like a battle bots fight or you know like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We used to do those in high school demolition derbies. Oh, that's awesome. We, that's how we raise money for our football lights. So all the football <laughs> players we. We build cars and go take them to the fairgrounds. And so, what are winning uh, tactics in a demolition derby? Winning tactics for demolition derbies: um, uh, try to find a if you can find an old like uh, Cadillac station wagon. They used to make these 500 cubic inch front wheel drive Cadillacs. Um, then you can just use your whole rear end as a weapon because you don't you're not worried about anything back there. Because the radiator is uh, going to break if you use the front, and so that's yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, it's all about like beefing them up. And then there's a lot of pre smashing the cars so that they, when you do smash them, they bend in the way you want them to bend. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So you'll like pre dent the frame 
and put notches and things to make it so like it doesn't bend into a tire and cut your tires and do you ever weld an additional support uh sometimes there's rules against that but uh, you gotcha. usually have a you have a bar between behind the driver that spans the doors it's illegal to hit the driver's door head on like you don't want to, no direct hits to the driver's door that makes sense but you have you had to put some uh there's definitely some safety and there's no more glass left in the car your fuel tank and battery are inside um you chain all the doors shut so they don't open and uh yeah then you try to put some enforcement and try to toughen things up as best you can to get hammered on what do the how do you put in reinforcement if you can't uh if you can't weld additional enforcement into the car like what are some of the other ways to do it so like if you had a tube frame like some people would cut open the tube frame and like stuff it full of rebar and then weld it <laughs> You so you're kind of cheating, but like you wouldn't, you'd never know. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's something, it depends on, I think it depends on the, the, uh, the arena or the event on what their rules are. But um, yeah, it's, there are definitely people that are pretty good at prepping their cars. Like you'll see some people out there just getting destroyed and other cars just keep running. And you're like, how is that thing still running? Oh, they're yeah. cheating. Yeah. <laughs> now they're just more creative. <laughs> <laughs> On ways awesome. around the rules. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, I guess if you're not technically breaking the rules, you know, then you're you're more creative. Like you said, it's vertical yeah. thinking. I mean, that stuff still happens in F1, right? Yeah. In NASCAR. They're yeah. always trying to skirt the rules. There that's was this one it. competition at Carnegie Mellon I heard about where it was like a stair climbing competition and somebody apparently had like a tarp over their robot and um they pull it off and it's a blimp with a string hanging down <laughs> just drove it over the stairs. i love it i love it that's awesome i mean the perfect stair climbing robot yeah it just floats up yeah see creativity i love it yeah yeah me too yeah there's there's some interesting ones um I had a battle bot that would, um, it was a six pound steel bar that would spin at 6,000 RPMs and it had a, uh, snail cam. So it would lift up and smash down from the top. Oh, nice. And at the time, nobody really armored their top. So, you know, I was horrible at driving. I didn't get any hits that way, but like, I, I remember somebody built one that got pretty popular soon after that. And I, I don't know. I like to think they were inspired by my design. Yeah, <laughs> probably. Know. Yeah. Yeah. I should have done that. I never got into the battle. I always like enjoyed watching it, but yeah. never. Well, but it's me with Junkyard Wars. <laughs> yeah, because they were doing a lot of it near, like in Mare Island and in, in the Bay Area. I think it was right around here, which isn't too far from here. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess to take it back to EXO for a minute, like what happened sure. after the Bleaks uh, system that you built? So. Uh, yeah, so I quit my job, moved up to the Bay Area. And week one was a shocker. So first thing I learned was that that thing consumed like, I don't know, it was like three kilowatts of power, right? It just had a, it had a two stroke IC engine, just screaming, trying to power <laughs> the hydraulic power supply. And they're using these, um, these move servo valves, which have a really high bypass flow. So they just like have a, they're super inefficient. Like they're great in an uh. F- F35, but like, you're just dumping all this fluid by these valves to get the performance, like really high speed performance. Brutal. So like, it just was tough. Right. And so it was like, you said three first, kilowatts. It was dry. Yeah. Yeah. Three that's, kilowatts. that's wild. Yeah. That's tough to, to carry around three kilowatts on a, you know, <laughs> quietly. <laughs> you said a two stroke, but were you the one that told me about one that was powered by a turbine too? Or was that, Oh, I I think there was a guy, there was a team trying to make, uh, that was later on. I think it was part of the Talos project we were working on. Uh, Somebody had a turbine based power supply they were trying to make. And I don't (laughs) think it, I don't think it was direct power. I think it was like a turbine generator. Oh, okay. Uh, And then what was the other interesting engine? They're they're still out there. What's the interesting, it's like that trilobe engine. They're still trying to make it Oh, the Wankel? It's not a Wankel. It's somebody else that's, uh, God, I forgetting the name of it um they have this weird uh trilo it's almost like a winkle but it's not quite i forget what their name is but they they make uh it's pretty like power dense uh ic engine design i think it's a two-stroke oh cool um but it's still out there like i think it still has some interesting use cases but like at the time you got to remember this is 2004 so 
batteries, like the best batteries we could find. Well, so that was the problem, right? It's like, okay, three kilowatts is crazy. Humans, what, what do we take to stand? Like you, you use three kilowatts, whether you're walking or standing still on the robot, it didn't matter. Like Jesus. you're still going to burn three kilowatts. It's like, well, wait a minute. Humans use like, what, 100 watts to stand still? Like, yeah, I think, that's, I think that's the yeah. stat I heard. And so it's like, okay, like we got to be like, we're, we're something's wrong here. We got to be more like a human. So how do we do that? So week one realized we had a huge power problem. I also showed the video to my brother who was the Navy SEAL at the time. And his response was, oh, we're never going to use that. It's too heavy. It's too slow. It's too loud. And I was like, okay, so life lesson, like, if you're going to bet the farm on a new technology, talk to some of the end users before you uh, Amen. dive in at first. And I was like, okay, great. Well, I was like, well, I had a year contract. I'm like, oh, we got a year to figure it out. So we'll get to work. And then, um, so that was like four days in. And then I think it was Memorial Day, 2004. I get a call from my mom. My brother actually was in an accident. Same Navy SEAL brother. Uh, sorry to hear that. Um, and he broke his neck. And so I got a call. My brother broke his neck. He's in the hospital. So I went and got on a plane flying across the country thinking about how we can use exoskeletons to get him up and walking again. Because at the time, I knew nothing about um, spinal cord injury, right? I just assumed, like, if you broke your neck, you don't walk. So go, you know, sketching ideas on the flight out there and uh, get into his hospital room. And I'm like, don't worry, brother. We'll figure out a way to get you walking again. And he's like, oh, I can walk just fine. I just can't move my arms. And I was like, what? And so he had what's called central cord syndrome where he was a C6, C7, so really high in the neck. And he basically damaged the um, outside of his spinal cord. And so here's this like Bronze Star Navy SEAL. He's got huge guns and he can't even pick up his own arm. Brutal. So he could walk. He just couldn't like couldn't even lift his own arms under the weight. But fortunately, he was able to recover. Um, he did a ton of therapy and basically awesome. rebuilt his, his house over a couple of years. And now he complains that he can only do like 25 pull-ups. <laughs> You can only can squat like 500 pounds. Yeah, <laughs> right. So <laughs> he calls himself the world's strongest incomplete quadriplegic. Because <laughs> that, that's his medical record. record. <laughs> yeah, so he's uh, totally recovered and fine. But that actually set us on a trajectory of thinking about medical exoskeletons, which um, was interesting. But we still had to solve the power problem. So we... Um, we uh, focused on like... We started looking at the prosthetic industry. I was like, well, wait a minute. Like if you have if you're an amputee, like how do you walk on a prosthetic ankle and knee? Like you don't have power in those. At the time, I think there was I think Oser had a powered prosthetic knee, but there's a lot of passive devices out there that people can walk on. And so we started looking at some of those things and you start looking at, you know, human walking dynamics and you realize like the knee's primarily a damper for level ground walking. And so um we built uh we called exo hiker which basically had active damping on the knees and a a frame and a joint architecture that could support 200 pounds passively oh, so cool. like literally you could take a person out of it and you could put 200 pounds and balance it on the on the structure without any joints and it That's would support awesome. it and then um but that same architecture lets you get inside there and have a bunch of the, all the freedom and degrees of freedom that you wanted so it was really clever architecture um, to enable that. And then from there, we basically started adding more power, right? So um, that kind of, we kind of reset the baseline of like how much power is required for an exoskeleton. And so like, um, yeah, we started going the passive route early on, which it's funny because nowadays you look at any exoskeleton products out there and anything that's, you know, quasi successful, I'd say in the commercial space, they're all passive, right? There's no powered exoskeleton that's that's making a dent yet because that's really hard to do so some of the like best things that we were making there's a bunch of those out there now um some of these lift assist suits um they're all passive but that's really like the i think the toehold for exoskeletons is the you know smart design with passive technology to you know augment that human on what they're bad at which is typically endurance you don't really need extra strength you're typically doing like some sort of gravity compensation so um because of that, it's like it, they're they're typically task specific. Like that you can't sense. make a <laughs> you can't make a passive exoskeleton that can do everything. Like that's impossible. Yeah, um, that makes sense. But if you make so an that, active one, it'll draw three kilowatts. So yeah, I think we're getting better about figuring out how to how to put power in. I mean, 
just to think back to 2005 when we started doing these things and like the challenges we had finding good motors, good gearboxes, uh, good batteries, good electronics, good like uh, good sensors, like everything was just big, heavy, clunky. And uh, nowadays, there's uh, a lot more tech that's available on the shelves. You don't have to invent everything. So hopefully, um, you'll start seeing more power assist type stuff coming out with uh, the the shrinking of these and the uh, extra energy density in some of these types of motors and drives. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing I haven't gotten to do yet that I want to do is, is winding custom motors for a project. That's uh, <laughs> haven't had yeah. a chance yet, but it just seems like fun. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know enough about motor. That's just magic. Well, I mean like just paying a company to do it. <laughs> this is more what I mean. Wind your custom motor. Yeah. 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 I mean, at the time we were buying, uh, we were buying a ton of like hobby motors because the RC industry was making like i remember this company called fin gap that was making like these square copper conductor uh motors that you know was super uh had super dense right instead of using the regular motor wire they're using square wire right to increase the performance that's interesting but none of these things like none of them were rated like none of them were like had any life rating like at one time i remember we were testing an exoskeleton in the back of uh the in the basement in berkeley and uh like none of our cells ever had lithium cells ever had any protection on them and all of a sudden man the battery pack just starts smoking oh, we're, been like, there. we're like 150 feet underground like down this hallway <laughs> and i just grabbed the box out of the back of the guy that was wearing it and take off running down the hallway and throw it outside we call all campus. you can do yeah call the campus we're like hey we just had a battery go off and you handled like, it with oh. your bare hands you didn't have like a trash can or anything no, it was in a bo- It was in a container. Like we had it in a box in the, in like the backpack. Yeah. So I just grabbed the whole thing, ripped the wires out because they were just the Anderson plugs. Yeah, so those are easy to. Those run. as I took off running down the hall was like when, when those batteries catch fire too. Sometimes what'll happen is like the leads rip out of the battery because it melts the interface. Right. I've had that happen. I, I think at a BattleBots event I was at, we had a uh, battery run away on a charger, and there was um, just because this is a thing that happens with hobby batteries. Somebody had, and I think some of these weren't balanced charging because you could, couldn't could get the batteries out of all the battle bots because they were built so janky. And so yeah. you'd hook it up in place and charge it. So I think we threw the whole bot in like a thing of kitty litter and like ran it outside, you know, like as fast as we could. Right. <laughs> you know. Well, you, you can't put it out. You're yeah. just like, wait. Yeah, yeah exactly. It would be terrifying to think about like a Tesla going off of one of those battery packs. Like that's a lot like of Like 1,600 pounds or something. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh. That's going to take a while. <laughs> yeah, I'll be, I'll be back in a day. You heard yeah. about uh, Richard Hammond from, uh, from Grand Tour or Top Gear, like catching that, uh, there was like some kind of, it was the Remek Concept 1. He like crashed it and it caught fire and it was like on fire for three days. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah. Some, I think it was like a Croatian supercar, but I might be wrong on, on the country. That's the one where he like got hurt in it too when he crashed it. He, he like went off. Yeah, he might have ended up in a neck brace after that or something. Yeah, I think I remember the crash. I don't remember the yeah. battery aspect of it. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, I think the uh I think it was meant to have like taken three days to get out. They might have embellished though a little bit. I mean it's top gear. Oh yeah, so. I'm sure. <laughs> I love his new I love his new show. Uh um what's it called? Uh Clarkson's Farm. Oh yeah, I've, I've watched them all. That's yeah, really fun. <laughs> I think it's great because I think it like gives people insight to like how hard farming is. Well, you like, actually do this. So we were talking about this before we started recording. You're getting ready for like a 4-H event, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah so I like- run um, our large animal uh, uh, for our local 4-H club. And so we're getting ready for the Napa County Fair, which starts next week. So we were down at the farm. We got um, six steers, 10 hogs. I think 12 sheep and some goats and some turkeys and rabbits. And yeah, we got a bunch of kids that, you know, spend a lot ton of time raising these animals at the, we have a community farm that they do this at, and then we'll go take them to fair and they show them and uh, auction them off at the end. It's, it's a really cool experience for these kids. I mean, it's a lot of, a lot of early mornings and late nights working on their animals and, you know, teaches them good work ethic and responsibility. So I, it's a great keep the money from the auctions. Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's a total that's business. Like my yeah. son's got his own spreadsheet, like all of his expenses, like he tracks all, I mean, he's probably 
it's probably in a steer like five grand already oh wow how much do they and go for uh it depends uh last year the grand champion which is kind of an anomaly i think went for forty six thousand dollars oh wow okay um, so you can you can do I, all right yeah you can i think typically you know they're getting like nine dollars a pound eight dollars a pound which they're weighing in at like 1400 pounds that's not horrible yeah yeah that's that's pretty it's good, good. Return, yeah. adam since december so that's like 10k right? so, that he's making on that animal yeah yeah that's that's pretty good i mean that's better than i did as a kid <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. It's better than I did as a kid. We were yeah. happy we got three dollars a pound. Yeah, yeah. Now we're make... fortunate that we're in the Napa area. We got a lot of uh, I made a like lot eight of... bucks an hour working IT at Cornell. <laughs> <That's my first laughs> <job. laughs> yeah, we have a lot of generous. Um, like Napa County is a, like it's known for its winery, which is a bunch of farmers. Right, there's a big ag community, and there's just not a lot of kids left that are interested in ag. So they uh, do what they can to support these kids. It's great. Some of the like Good. some of the buyers, they'll buy like one of my son's hog buyers. They bought the animal, um, you know, paid I think it was like fifteen, sixteen dollars a pound for a hog, and then they donated it to the food bank. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah. So yeah. I mean, it's 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 all about charity, man. It's a great event. You know, it's good that they get some money to take home at the end. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's a full time job. They're down there every morning, every night, and this winter was rough. But, it was raining here a lot all winter, like out there in the dark, in the mud, getting them come in and feed them. And yeah, it's a lot of, a lot of effort. They really put in a t lot of time to yeah. get these animals to, to be uh, awesome. Yeah. Well, so like, I mean, I, I told you already, I know nothing about farming except having watched all of Clarkson's farm. Yeah. And like those scenes of him just panicking, <laughs> like when something goes wrong, like it's real. You can see it in his face. I mean, he's like, Oh yeah, it's real. Yeah, he's like, losing it. <laughs> stuff happens all the time. Like um, what happened the other day? I had a buddy was telling me one of his friends they were hauling a load of uh, cattle uh, up to a different piece of property, and they got in a wreck, and they wrecked the they wreck flipped the trailer right, and there's like fifty cattle in there, and so you got to like go and I think some of them died, some of them made it, some of them were hurt. Like, but it's like. Like real shit happens real fast. That's fucking brutal. Yeah. yeah. 50 in a trailer. Uh, At least. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, but it's cool. Like the kids learn a lot and uh, it's fun to see them grow as, you know, usually they're pretty shy with their animals, but then, you know, we also put them to work down there. They learn how to build facilities. We, we built all the steer facilities this year. So, it's a good way to get these kids, you know, off of screens, outside, working in the dirt, building fence, getting dirty. Right? Yeah. You learn a lot of physics outside. Yeah. Now I'd imagine like, did you grow up doing farming stuff as well or did you get into yeah. it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it probably had some influence on your ability to do certain types of engineering, I would imagine. You know, like Oh yeah, like we like we started building like like welding and building stuff when I was like, I don't know eight years old. That's wild. So I, I started messing around with electronics when I was seven, but yeah. you definitely have way more internal combustion knowledge than I do. Like that's, that's palpable. Like yeah. I, I don't do a whole lot with internal combustion engines. I mean, I work on my own car uh, or I used to, and, and these days I take it to a tech cause it's cheaper. Right. But right. That's about it. But, um, you, you seem to know a ton about it and I'm, I'm guessing that came from there. So that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Just, fixing small engines. I, my, my daughter, she's in college now. And I remember she blew up her dirt bike. Uh, we were out on a trip and she went into this hill climb and came back and it was clanking. And I was like, Oh, turn it off. But it was a really cool experience. Cause like, you're right. It's really hard to work on, uh, modern cars. Like you just can't like, unless you got a scan tool and yeah, you know, scan tool. custom tools, you're, you're like, there's not a whole lot you can do. So, um, it was really cool because we were able to order the kit and we, tore the engine completely down, split the case and put the whole thing back together. And like it fired up and like to see that in her eyes, like, wow, we just sense of that accomplishment. Is, yeah, put awesome. it back together and it still works. And I was like, yeah, you can rebuild things. <laughs> <laughs> so it was super cool to, to go through that. And my other, my other kids, like he blew up his bike. He took it apart all by himself. He was older now and he's had enough experience with the engines. He blew a, and his was a two stroke. So it's a little bit easier, Nice. but he, uh, he seized a piston and, you know, got the parts and rebuilt the whole bike himself. And it's, uh, 
it's cool, right? Because they there's a ton of skills that you learn doing that, and it's it's sad that not everyone gets like I really miss in high school. We had a great shop program um, where we learned uh, I learned how to use a mill, lathe, forging, nice. welding, all in high school. I had brazing, mill, lathe in high school. I did not have welding. I, I never got good at that. Uh, I never got good at forging. I did woodworking maybe from around 12. I started messing around with um, programming at 13, so I got that early. Right. right. But, yeah, welding's one that I've, I've, I'm have i kind of jealous you got that. That seems like a, just a useful skill like to have. Yeah, I just welded for a project uh, for my robots, those two Delta robots. I took it home over the weekend and welded these tri-clamps on my nozzles so I could get rid of the the hose clamps and I nice. just like, Oh, I'll just take those home and weld those up. It's all stainless. And I was like, yeah, that's kind of fun. So I could still get to do it every once in a while, but I enjoy it. Like, and I wish like the school still so focused I'm, on I'm told that welding stuff. stainless is kind of tricky. Like, do you have to like back shroud it with argon in order to get that together? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Back shroud with argon. And this is all food grade stainless. So it's all 316 food grade. So you can't have any, uh, any junk coming through on the inside of your weld and you're welding the outside. So it's definitely trickier to weld. I'll take welded. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I have, I have a few buddies that are like really good at TIG that have like explained it to me, you know, and, and I'm still, I just don't have the dexterity yet, but I, um, like one of my battle bots has an all welded or had, I gave it away when I didn't have time for the sport anymore, but, um, it had like an all welded 60, 61 frame. And the way I designed it was kind of asinine cause I just didn't have the welding experience to know, the physics and, and how you're supposed yeah. to do it. So, yeah, well, and did, it's like, that's aluminum. what I think you're afraid of. <laughs> I guess he's yeah. Welding aluminum is tricky. I mean, the cool thing is like, it used to be really expensive to get a welder. Like, I mean, you're always talking like three or four grand. You can literally pick up a TIG welder for like 400 bucks. Are you serious? Yeah. And it's not going to be like, sure. It's not going to be like a production welding thing, but for a hobbyist, like you can literally pick up a welder for probably, it's going to probably cost you more to get the argon bottle. And it's going to cost you to get the welding thing. And then you can just start practicing on some carbon steel and like go to town on it. And that's how you, that's how you learn. And then once you get comfortable with the carbon steel, then you can do stainless steel and then aluminum and work your way through it. It's all a little different. And now you have YouTube too. Titanium easier or harder than aluminum. Titanium is a lot like stainless. Um, it, uh, so aluminum problem is it like the heat transfer is so high, right? It gets really hot. So you gotta have a lot of power in the joint to just melt the joint and not heat up the whole block of aluminum. Oh, that's interesting. And titanium is the opposite, right? It doesn't transfer heat as Titanium's good. Titanium's got weird heat transfer properties. Yeah, yeah. Like you said, like you get these weird localized hot spots and. Yeah, so like when you're machining it, right? If you don't get the heat out of the chip, right? Like it'll just melt. If the heat doesn't leave in the chip, it's just gonna melt your tools. <laughs> so um, yeah, titanium's weird, but uh, alumia, aluminum's is. pretty, yeah, for sure. And then you got to, yeah, I don't know. It's a pros, but like I said, YouTube's a great resource now for welding. There's a ton of cool welding videos on there. So anytime you're like trying to weld something that's new and hard and you're like, how should I set this up? Cause it's typically like, especially TIG welding, it's all about setup and cleanliness and like getting your joints right. And then like getting the machine set is probably the hardest thing. And then it's the actual dexterity of the welding, but like getting everything dialed in and so the, the prep setting. is more important than the dexterity of the welding like getting that yeah well, i mean there's definitely the art in that part but like the null like the know-how to actually even know where to start to set up the machine is like the first the time majority. i ever tried to weld anything i i mig welded like a cylinder and i didn't have the gas turned on <laughs> so yeah. it's got the worst crater i think i kept it for years yeah and it, even though awesome. it should have been an embarrassment i just like i'm like that's ah, that's as far as i've gotten <laughs> well i remember we we had my buddy down the street had this old go-kart and we were trying, we put a new motor. We put a, I don't know what motor it had on there, but we took like an old 150 two stroke uh, dirt bike engine and mounted it to it and got it chained up. But one of the front spindles was broken and it was chromoly and we didn't know that at the time. Oh no. Um, <laughs> and so we were trying to ar like stick weld it. And his dad had an old, like the old uh, buzz box, the tombstone stick welder. And his, his sticks were probably old and corroded. So we had no idea what we were doing. And so we were just kept on sticking the electrode to the well, like where we wanted it to weld. And it wouldn't actually weld. It would just get stuck and we'd break it off. And then we'd do it again and then break <laughs> it off and do it again and break it off. And it was like, finally, we got enough stuff built up where we were kind of hold. And then we put this cart down and just snapped off. And then the dad finally came up and he's like, what are you doing? And we're like, we're trying to weld this. He's like, oh, all right. 
let me show you. <laughs> How do you actually so, yeah. weld chromoly? Because I thought chromoly uh, was supposed to weld nice, but it does. But yeah. you got to have a TIG welding. It's fine. Oh, okay, I got it. Yeah, you got to have the right uh, filler rod. That yeah, was the thing. That we're, makes sense. So you're right using like a dissimilar material, which is why it was all janky. Yeah. Well, and we just didn't even know how to strike an arc with a stick welder. This was like our first, like, oh, hey, there's a welder. Let's fire it up. See if it work. We can make it work. Like, I mean, that's kind of an awesome way to learn, though. I don't right? even think we were wearing goggles at the time. We were probably just like doing this. You know? <laughs> Safety squints. Like, Am I close? Yeah. <laughs> that's how you learn. <laughs> that's how you learn. Yeah. Sounds going through. Hang on. Let me shut that. Yeah, no worries. I can turn a light on too. I'm getting dark, huh? I remember um, trying to teach my sister how to solder when I was I was a kid, and she was a younger kid. And I pointed to where I wanted her to solder, and she burned my finger, and that was the end of that. <laughs> so. Oh, yeah, yeah, a lot of welds, a lot of burns from welding. But I, like I said, I wish, um, like, I was fortunate to I. I wish I still, I used to have a shop before we started EXO or when I, I had a little machine shop. And then once we got enough space at EXO, I sold it back to EXO so we could just use it there. Cause I was just using it for EXO. That makes sense. Uh, but now I miss it. I was like, oh man, like it's hard to rebuy like all the lays and mills and band saws. Oh, you sold that. the whole shop. Okay. Yeah. Cause I didn't, I was paying rent on it for, and I would, we'd use it for EXO, but it was up, it was in Napa and we we're down in Berkeley. And so I would have to go up there to work on stuff. And once we, finally moved out we were on like this fourth floor of this 100 year old building in berkeley which is probably like the last building standing after that earthquake <laughs> that shouldn't be standing and so we had no place to put it so once we moved into a bigger shop that could or a facility that could handle it we moved it all down there so we could use it there but i miss it i miss having all that why not build it back up uh i will like i have i have some stuff here like i do a lot of contract stuff now like that's the other thing I've learned is like there's shop, like I enjoy it for my own projects, but when I'm doing consulting and doing projects, like I just don't have the time to do that. So I, I sub yeah, out. I've noticed that like, too. I'll, yeah. I'll do my design work. And then I have a couple good shops that I'm like, I don't have, like it, it just doesn't pencil anymore. Yeah. Like, that's I'll kind of it. I, I I'm the same way. Like I've got an electronics bench uh, at my place and I've got uh, another workstation and then a paint station. And it's kind of embarrassing. The electronics bench is, bench is just covered with projects I've been meaning to get to. But like, right. you know, I'm doing contract engineering. I don't have the time for that. And so yeah. ironically, like my, you know, day job doing engineering is getting in the way of me being into, you know, working with my hands. So right. I, I just fly a desk all day anymore. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Gotcha. No, I, I like it just for my own sanity there or tinker on ideas yeah. that I have. I, I'll with. probably get back into it at some point. Like there was a while where like, I needed to to run the bandsaw like anywhere I was working for a little bit a day just to be sane or like, you know, just, just use a mill for like, you know, like an hour out of the day, you know, just to kind of yeah. keep my brain working correctly. But I don't know, these days, I mean, a, a lot of my day is sales, a lot of it's project management, a lot of it's, um, you know, um, just kind of brainstorming client management. Um, I don't know. A, a lot of it's just relationship building and yeah, you know, white collar type stuff. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, I know the I know the drill. Podcasting. <laughs> yeah, podcasting, but it it is like I think it's important and fun just to get out there and turn some metal or weld something. It doesn't matter what it is, right? It's just a good skill to have, and feels yeah. good when you make something. It always feels good when you make something. I think that's why we became engineers. Yeah, we like to make that's true. Or like your daughter, like when you fix something that was broken and you're just able to get it up and running. Like I, this is. Yeah also embarrassing but i had a laptop get hit by a train and i should fix it like it's it's got you know like a twelve thousand dollar solidworks license on it uh so oh, wow. yeah and it's not a cheap laptop either um but i don't know i bought like new body panels for it on ebay and i've been meaning to frankenstein the guts in and it's just like i don't really need it right now <laughs> like i've got, yeah. got other <laughs> stuff running yeah, yeah. that's <laughs> That's the hard thing. But that, like, my kids are all getting older. So as they get older, I'm like, oh, I, you know, I'll have more time to, to tinker and work on stuff in the shop as they start. I have two of them now are in college. I only got cool. one left. So, yeah. yeah do you have any uh, any projects you're sort of planning for when that happens? Like, uh... no, I do have this. Is my my youngest son wants me to get. I have an old 1960 Dodge uh, Power Wagon that's Bad sitting ass. up. At, 
foothills that he wants to get up and running. So I need to get that down before he heads off to college and get that up and running again. Like I parked it 20 years ago <laughs> and um, I went up there. Was that this summer? No, that was last, was that last summer? Or maybe that was early this summer. Maybe that was early this summer, or early this year. I went up there and tried to check on, see if it, like one of the tires had gone flat. So I had, I got to use the cool, like put starting fluid in your tire and then light it to blow the tire up to get it to reseat the bead. I've never so heard of fun. that trick. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. It's pretty, except there's like a bunch of dry pine needles around. So it's probably not the best idea. Ah, but, I mean, you know. <laughs> it was kind of cool because you, you get the air fuel mix, you're wrong. So you spray too much, you inherit, it's like a potato gun. You inherently spray too much fuel in there and there's not enough air. And yeah. then, so it's sitting there just burning and then you just start kicking the tire and eventually it gets enough air in there to where it lights off and just goes and sets the tire. That's awesome pretty, that that actually causes it to set. <laughs> yeah, totally works. Cause yeah. I got it. I didn't have a big enough compressor up there to get it to set and I can't move it anywhere. So I got that going and then got the, uh, I hooked up a, a new fuel line to a gas tank to try to get it to start and cranked it over cranked over fine but then when i went out there there was just i think all the gaskets and the carburetor gone there's ah! just, there just fuel everywhere i was like okay what did it i'm not no it's just leaking just oh leaking yeah fuel everywhere. <laughs> i was like oh i'm glad it didn't fire i might have really lit the lit the place on fire would <laughs> <laughs> have been bad when i was a kid my brother um my brother's friend shot himself in the face with a potato cannon that'd oh. be medevaced <laughs> that's pretty brutal um, and I, I remember being there and hearing about it and, you know, they both survived it. Uh, nobody, nobody got killed. I think, um, the brother's friend needed to have like bits of potato surgically removed from his eye. And then they, you know, they, oh, they, wow. they got him. I mean, you can see again, but oh, like, good. yeah, yeah. You know, um, but, um, you know, I was like, you idiots, like, you know, what were you clicking the igniter while you were looking down the barrel and they go, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah because my mom don't, was in the room <laughs> like, don't, don't let, it, the, let the cat out of the bag yeah the, a um, different story <laughs> i remember we had one and i think when we ran out of uh we ran out of starting fluid and so then we tried to use oxyacetylene to light it <laughs> off. and uh that one actually that one was funny so we like i think we just dumped it we didn't actually so if we were smart right we would have lit the uh lit the torch got a good flame then put the flame out then filled it with that mixture, which is the perfect stoichiometric mixture. Oh, yeah, and then lit it off. That would have been awesome. We didn't think that we we didn't know enough back then, so we just filled it with acetylene, which acetylene's heavy, right? So it just like sinks <laughs> in there and like like it, nothing. Like we close it in and we're sitting there trying to spark it off, spark it off, spark it off. Nothing happens. So it's literally sitting on the concrete, like face down, with the potato still in it. We unscrew the big four-inch sewer coupling on the back. And it's just sitting on top and we're like looking for new stuff to to put in there to try to get it to light off like spray paint or whatever anything we can find that said flammable and all of a sudden <laughs> somebody dropped something on the floor and the acetylene spontaneously went off and my hand was sitting right over the top of the cap oh no it blew the cap up and hit my hand like it didn't it didn't hurt but it scared the hell out of us yeah like, it's terrifying not playing with acetylene after that i was like ooh, that's I, scary i heard an oxyacetylene story in high school i wasn't there for this but I think the story was like it involved a trash bag full of oxyacetylene mixed in the way that you described would have been the right way. Yeah. And um, somebody with a flaming arrow like hitting the trash bag. And uh, apparently they blew out all the windows on one side of the person's house that was chasing. Oh, I, I, I'm sure it would. Like that, that's <laughs> like serious. That's a serious uh, explosion. They used to do that. That was always a demo that one of these chemistry professors would do down at Cal Poly where he'd have just pure acetylene and pure oxygen and then light them both off individually and they kind of burn right just yeah. these balloons and it was in a lab it was a big lab but it was in a lab and the balloons were only this big and then he would do the mixed one and let it off and you're like oh like it's no joke yeah it's wild yeah I mean, that's how you learn about that combustion pyramid <laughs> <laughs> triangle yeah 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 i don't know how we all made it through with all our fingers like yeah, all the crazy yeah i'm lucky to have them yeah, actually, I did cut. I did cut a thumb off at one point, but they put it back on. Nice. <laughs> yeah. How'd you do that, Bansa? Uh, my first patent. Um, so uh, no, it was one of those spooling machines for Lucent. We had one of these big. It was a big aluminum spool, and it uh, it came out of this. It's like think of it spinning forth. It's like 
16 and a half inch diameter thread bobbin, right? That's like three feet wide with a big flange and all, all nickel plated aluminum that would wind, it would hold uh, 500 kilometers of optical fiber. Oh, wow. And so this thing's spinning. What diameter fiber, five, just to picture it? Just the individual fiber, like okay. your hair. Okay, got like, it. Yeah, like not in a cable or anything, but the raw fiber, like the stuff you would do off a draw tower. So the whole idea was uh, Lucent at the time wanted to do continuous winding. So they wanted to be able, every time you started up a draw tower, you have these big quartz preforms that you have to start melting. And it takes a while to get to a steady state process and start pulling the fiber out of this big quartz preform that's getting, it's like a giant glue gun. Think of a yeah. giant glue gun. Yeah. Right. So that starting blob comes down and then you start pulling it and you get everything set right. And then from there, you can just keep winding fiber. Well, the biggest spool they had at the time was 500 kilometers. And they're like, well, if we could switch from one spool to the next spool, uh, then we wouldn't have to, we could do bigger preforms and we wouldn't have all those startup losses. We could just keep running continuously. Yeah. And so the trick was how do you do that at 50 meters a second when you have um, like, I don't know, less than a pound of tension in the line and you have very little like take up in your dancers. So it has to be like seamless. Dancers are like right? idler, like. Uh, yeah, like your thing. take up, right? Okay. It's like your take up in your in your web. Yeah. And so um figured out this really cool way where embedded a piece of wire in a label so the wire would would crack the uh the fiber um at the same time it would stick it to the barrel of a new dremel so you'd put this wheel down on the thing draw the fiber underneath it feed a label that would stick it down and then you it would use the embedded piece of stainless steel wire that would simultaneously stick it and cut it right so no no active like cutters or grabbers it was just a stick a label like from a label maker literally that was the prototype of the label maker oh that's awesome uh, and so we were working on that and luckily i built a cage around the whole thing uh while we were working on the prototype and uh i don't know i don't know if like the air pressure came down or something but basically the spool came out at 4,000 rpm Holy and the uh, flange, flange hit got between my hand and the one of the the cage bars ah <laughs> whack through my thumb brutal <laughs> So I cut, did, like it, I, did it come clean off? Was it hanging? Like what was the, Oh, you can't really see it, but it's basically, there's a big scar here that comes all the way through my wrist. Oh, I got you. Yeah. So it's down to here. So okay. I, cut, I cut like through my, my hip, my wrist was upside down. So it cut through almost to my palm. So I was like looking at the inside of my palm. Oh, it's wild. From the back of my hand. Yeah. That's the worst when you can see the muscle yeah. and it's just like, Oh God, how did I get here? Yeah. And it doesn't well, like, hurt yet crazy. because your body won't let it. <laughs> it doesn't yeah, realize. the craziest thing, like from a from a, a robotics perspective, is so I had like a lot of surgeries to put it back together to make it all work, and um, I lost the the ability to pick my thumb up like that. that. So that big tendon that you see on the back of your thumb, like that that came off during one of the surgeries, like the first surgery, and so I was in a cast for so long that it retracted, and so there's no way to hook that back up. So, which is kind of a bummer. So this is my hand, right? So my thumb yeah. would always be stuck down. So anytime you like go to put your hand on a table, your thumb would hit first and it was like, oh, so Can uh, you my manually hands. manually articulate, like just out of curiosity? Oh yeah, you could totally do okay. it by hand. Like, yeah. Once you put your hand down, but you would, I would just catch it on that. Plus I'd lost like feeling in it. So you wouldn't even know you were hitting it on things. So that was kind of a bummer. But um, the, the surgeon's like, well, you have two fingers or two tendons to your pointer finger. That's why you can, you can point so well, but you can't flip somebody off quite as well. Like that oh, one goes yeah, that's, that's straight. Did, like did if, you, not know that. if you try to hold him down, you have two tendons. So he took the extra tendon off of that finger yeah. and put it onto my thumb. Oh, so cool. now I can't, I can't point, but I can lift my thumb up. <laughs> nice. <laughs> the How crazy did it thing. How your brain was, to remap that just out of curiosity? So here's the crazy thing. Yeah. I was, I was in the surgery. They do what's called a beer block. So they do a nerve block in your arm. So I was awake for the surgery. Oh, wow. So they, put a nerve, they put a nerve block in your upper arm. And like, I'm talking to him the whole time. He just, you know, cutting through. He's like, all right, we got that one off. We're pulling it back through. He's like, okay, it's hooked up. And I'm like, looking at my hand. He's like, okay, move your thumb. And I'm like, doesn't move. And he's like, move your finger. And I move my finger and my thumb moves at the same time. <laughs> and I'm literally That's like, wild. now, now think about this, right? I have a nerve block. So like, there's no nerve sensation going down that arm. So it's purely based on the visual feedback. It literally took like five seconds for my brain to realize that that tendon was now hooked to my thumb and my finger was separate. Five and second learning like, curve. That's awesome. I was sitting there in the, I'm like in surgery. I'm like, oh my God, like that's crazy. That's insane. And my doctor, Dr. Wizikowski out of, out of if you ever need a hand surgeon, he's great. 
Um, Dr. Wisikowski, like, I got to remember that. <laughs> he, he's like, you're such a dork. I'm like, no, you don't understand how hard it would be to program a robot to just adapt to like switching an actuator from one thing to the other without yeah, any course. Feedback. Just looking at it with a camera. It's like, yeah. oh, oh, that's how it works. Okay, I got it no now. Problem. Yeah. For the rest of my life. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So it was pretty funny. Interact. He's like, you're such a dork. I'm like, oh, dude, that's that's crazy. If you could do that on robots, like that'd be amazing. Yeah. Well, it seems like that might be the direction it's going with like some of the like AI based, you know, positioning stuff that we're seeing like out of Google and some of the other spots. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The, the camera training where you just give them video cues on how to teach them. Or it's like language based and you tell it to do a thing and it sort of like twitches in that direction till it figures it out. Like, yeah. I don't know. I, I mean, it, it doesn't seem like we're totally there yet in terms of like like a rock solid just fluid demo that I've seen, unless you know of one that I don't. But I feel um, like it's moving in that direction. Like it's it's I don't know. It's, it's getting pretty, pretty wild it, to see. Yeah. It's getting close. I mean, I I've been using some, um, uh, you know, machine vision uh, AI um, machine learning. I don't know what you want to call it. Um, but basically, right, a lot of math on a lot of trained images. <laughs> But it's amazing to me, like how well, especially when you're working with like, uh, I'm working with uh, ag products, right? Which are not like, it's not like machine vision where you're looking at the same machine part every time looking for defects. Like you're looking at something made by God that has all sorts of variability. Yes, yeah, so you and need that segmentation. Yeah, well, I need that. I got the segmentation, but then I'm trying to differentiate between what's good and what's bad. And the difference between what's good and what's bad is really hard to see. And there's huh. like all these other variables on top of it. And you can literally like just feed it a boatload of this is good data, this is bad data, and like it's ninety five percent accurate out of the gate. And you're just like, I don't like it's amazing. Like you can't do it with traditional machine vision at all to catch these things. Ninety eight percent, ninety five. Pretty 95. wild, even still. Yeah, yeah, ni yeah. I'm trying to get to ninety eight percent. That'd be great if I could, but I think it's a lighting issue now. So I think I've. I think I need to change some of my lighting setups to try to, cause like you can't even see it. The human eye can't see, like it sees things that I can't see. But um, like if, if something's really hard to tell, if it's, you know, a, a good result or a bad result, like if you can't tell looking at the image, it's really hard for the machine I don't know vision. what you're trying to image, but would like maybe near infrared make sense for what you're trying to do? I am using near infrared. Oh, okay. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm using some complex near infrared. I've tried some SWEAR stuff. I've tried some hyperspectral stuff. Um, so I think we're getting close, but like no one's been able to do this. So it's it's a um, yeah, it's a, it's a really hard project. So I think there's like for the ag industry for like um, AI for machine vision and sorting stuff because most of the sorters out there are still using traditional machine learning, like you know looking for a color or a a uh, pixel size or something, some sort of defect marker. Yeah, and you can't Not really do that with something like you said, made by God, non-uniform. You know, just yeah, yeah like a, like a fruit is yeah. what I'm assuming it's, you're describing. Right. It's really hard. Yeah. So yeah, I think there's like, I think that this is gonna be really interesting. Both like, it's kind of interesting coming. I used to joke with people at, when I was at Exoskeleton. I was like, I always just wanted to be a farmer. I just got into Exoskeleton somewhere along the way. And, you know, maybe there will be exoskeletons out in the field, but, you know, you, to see the amount of robotics and automation going into the ag field. It's oh, yeah. Really I mean, John Deere was a really early adopter there. I yeah, mean absolutely. Yeah. And these guys, you know, and I think that missing ingredient was, you know, the, the connectivity, like, and then having the being able to do AI on the edge um, and have some of these vision platforms, because like. Well, I mean, just the new compute modules that are coming out, like the Orion yeah. and like the AGX before that, and like even the other NVIDIA stuff. And I mean, it's insane what you can do, you know, the, the stuff that didn't even, need, you know, you couldn't even conceive of until five years ago, maybe. Right. right. Yeah, no, it's crazy. But it all has to be like vision based, right? Because you're not in a factory. You're in an unconstrained, unknown environment dealing with an unknown product, an unknown, ever changing product, right? It's like every variable is thrown at you. And then you have to deal with, and it's a, and you typically a, you know, a dirty, dusty, hard environment that you're working in. And, uh, and the, the control interface has to be start, stop. <laughs> that's your, that's your requirement from like, oh, what kind of, 
what kind of user interface is there? Like, well, there's a start button and a stop button, and that's, that's awesome. all you have. Like, literally, I'll it's save be you some money on a touch screen. You know? <laughs> yeah, but that's the. I'm literally staring at my my button layout. I, got, I sorry, I have reset, stop, and start. <laughs> oh yeah, that's one more. <laughs> three buttons. Yeah. Three buttons. Sorry, three buttons. We're doing some stuff in uh, in I guess the solar space as well, and. Um, some of those interface, I mean, you try to make it as stupid, simple as you can, you know, because you want it to be intuitive, like for anyone yep. to use. And so yep. the less buttons you can get and still have functionality, I would say the better. Yeah. No buttons would be great yeah. if you could figure that out. Yeah, we did. Yeah. We did a robotic floor scrubber at one point, too. And we did the UI for that. And it was just we're just trying to get like big text, minimal interface. You know, I mean, we had to have a floor map. So that was a little more complex and we had a touch screen. Right. But, you know, that was that was pretty fun. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think those are like, those are the really fun problems. And like now and you don't have to invent everything. Like there's a lot of stuff that's on the shelf that you can, um, you know, bolt on and, and get going. I think, I think the, uh, some of the winners in this space are going to be, uh, the no code or low code AI developers or whoever makes a really yeah. good low code AI platform. There's a few interesting ones that I've been seeing, like kind of getting advanced where, you know, it's, yeah, if that works, like, I mean, I have, I have a friend who, um, you know, it, he's, he knows G code, but I, for that guy, I would think like if he could figure, if he had a good no code platform, he could just plug it in and get like up and running on his, you know, CNC mill for like a new, you know, thing he's trying yeah. to do. I mean, that would be hugely valuable because it just saves you all that time. Right. Yeah. No, I think like that's going to be really interesting. Like whoever comes up with those good, because like, it's hard, like no, not everyone has a dedicated programmer, right? Especially like these ad companies, they don't have anyone that like that does that. So if you can provide some sort of interface where they can they can update and train things that it's just like drag and drop and plug and play, like that's gonna people will start using that. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense to me. Yeah. Have you looked at um, trying to think who it was? Ah, it's the tip of my tongue. The guy talks a lot of shit on LinkedIn. Um, there's somebody working on a working on a no code platform. Oh, I don't his, know. His name's escaping me right now. Sorry oh. if you're listening. <laughs> yeah, you have to send it to me. I'll check it out. Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll, I'll find it for you if you remind me after. Um, it, yeah. It'll take me like two seconds to find the guy once I once I actually get on LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah. But no, I agree. I think that uh, that block based programming, that no code programming. I mean, that was. That was kind of UR's reason they got so much market adoption, right? Is that it was like easy right. to get it to do what you wanted it to do and like relative right. to the other ones. Right. Yep. So, yeah, like I just went through uh, trying to get like a FANUC machine to work with an external machine vision program. Oh, no. And, oh, no. Yeah. It was. I don't uh, play nice with others. <laughs> yeah. Right. I was <laughs> like, come on. Like, like I can't like literally I can't work within your guys's constraints like your environment, so just make and they they do have a it's they'll tell you to use point streaming if you if you nail them down it's appendix appendix B or whatever they actually have a manual on how to do it but I think we still have we still have some weird communication issues trying to get them to talk like to get the data points over and the part spinning um, but we got it to work but it um, not as not as uh, straightforward as you'd want it to be. Yeah, that's brutal. Yeah, yeah. I've I've <laughs> trying to integrate Fanuc stuff into a few different things. I, I get, I mean, I'm not like a hardcore automation engineer, so I've not like done a whole lot of robot arm programming. But I I dabble enough that I you know talk to people and I'm in the situations where I hear these stories. And I I, I had a coworker at, at a job I was at like try to nail down the Fanuc rep on like. Tell me how your serial servo bus works. I'm like, dude, they're not going to tell you that. Like, there's no way. Yeah. What are you high? No. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, that that was my favorite one because we had these. We were repurposing these Delta robots, and they have a fourth axis wrist. And we don't need a wrist for this application. It's literally like a vacuum tube that's just straight down, and it's a constant vacuum that just sucks off the product. Um, so there's no pick and place. It's just pick, 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 right? So it, they can go fast. We can do like 180 picks a minute. Oh wow! Um, which is like fast. what they—that's like what their spec, like their perform, like max capability. And we're like, oh yeah, we're hitting it. Um, that's awesome. But the I have to go around the 
wrist nozzle where they make another version of the robot that just has instead of having that they have a little gearbox down there where the the shaft comes in and it twists the wrist they have another platform which is just a machine base where the the, the six arms come in and mount to that's got a hole in the bottom so i asked the i called and i said can i just swap that out like i don't need the, i can leave the motor up there i don't care like i'll just take off put that other base on the bottom of the robot and then i can run my vacuum hose straight through the center instead of having to go around this thing and they're like oh no you can't do that i'll change you know all the kinematics of the robot oh come the, on the, i was like oh, come on like <laughs> it's not gonna change like i'm adding extra mass for my nozzle like like come on they're gonna be close like yeah i think we can't it was just, we can't like, just a, tune it in <laughs> like yeah so maybe if, if I get frustrated enough, maybe I'll just machine a new base for it. But they probably won't warranty that. Yeah. <laughs> probably not. <laughs> yeah. Hacking their robots. Yeah, but, they don't like uh, that. <laughs> no, it's frowned upon. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you own it. You can do whatever you want with it. Yeah, so. it's true. Yeah. yeah, well, I did get rid of the arms because they it was supposed to be a food grade robot, but the the drive arm for the wrist just rusted. I don't know if they use like 304 huh. stainless on it or something, but it's just rusted it, it bad. So I just pulled it out completely. Was it used or did you get like a new one and it still managed to rust? They were brand new when they started, but they were originally used on tomatoes, which are super acidic. Oh, uh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was pretty, it's a pretty rough environment. Like these food plants get pressure washed and soaked down every night. So if you have anything that's, not stainless it's going to rust like yeah like fast and it like sounds really like fast. if you have anything that's not 316 it's gonna rust yeah yeah 316 only yeah 304 <laughs> doesn't cut it it gets it starts surface rusting so yeah 316 only yeah. which stainless lately is really expensive i haven't looked lately like what's it up to per pound i mean i guess new is probably different than scrap and 316 yeah, is know. obviously like, different than 304 is different than 18 8 like, buying tubing fittings and stuff like you can easily drop like six hundred a thousand dollars just buying like i don't know it's like not even like 10 pounds worth of stainless that's wild yeah less than that yeah it's probably like five pounds worth of stainless yeah yeah another fun story from uh from the carnegie mellon robotics club which i guess was different than the field robotics center is um i had a friend that was the shop master i feel like i didn't tell this like the statue of limitations has got to be up by now uh sorry if anyone's listening that's offended but <laughs> Um, we, uh, we had a project that we would refer to as Stilltron, um, and it was supposed to be an automated still for making uh, whiskey. Okay. <laughs> so, no, that's um, cool. Yeah. We, we never finished it, but we bought a whole bunch of materials on the shop budget because my buddy was the shop master. Oh, you never finished it. Uh, well, I mean, we, we, we had other stuff to do. Stainless? Uh, no, it was, it was mostly, uh, mostly copper. Okay. Yeah. But, um, there was, there was a stainless vessel and then a copper uh stack on it uh -huh. and then, like some big valves like it it was it was kind of a fun project but i mean we, we got bogged down with stuff and it's like one of those things where you're never going to make any money on it so it's just like all right i guess oh yeah this is this I is did a one, of love I, that was a covid project i built a still a little oh, five awesome. copper still for covid and what uh, kind of still did you go with Huh? Oh, uh, so or? there was. I bought a kit off of Amazon. So you, they sent you all of your like the two D copper shapes, and then you had to rivet and solder everything together. So it was great, cool. right? You just buy it. Like it comes in this big like, I don't know what size it was. Like three foot by four foot, like just stacked cardboard box with all your shapes, and then you <laughs> just form them with your pipe, then you form it all up and build it. So we built it and. Um, I did some I did some vodka in there and then I did some bourbon. I wanted to make some bourbon, call it bad water bourbon. And <laughs> then I realized like you do I only like I start you start with five gallons and then by the time you distill it, like it's like three days of work to get like seven hundred and fifty milliliters of bourbon after whatever three months and I'm like, wow, that's I'm just gonna go to the store. <laughs> 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 yeah, it makes like, sense. So like, if I was going to do it again, I'd make a really big steal. But, um, maybe that's frowned upon. Yeah. But yeah, it was kinda, it's kind of fun. I don't it's know why, to... though. Like, I feel like it, well, I don't know. I don't want to get into politics, but like, yeah. it's just kind of weird because it's like, you know, it's totally legal to buy it. <laughs> yeah. It's just a lot of work. Like, it takes a lot. It's a lot of work. To... I used to brew beer. I... And and yeah. like that, I did, I did a bunch of, and we'd always make these amazing batches and, 
I don't know. Maybe like the material cost was like a dollar a bottle, so uh, probably not okay. worth it if you if you have an alternative. Yeah. I was doing it for the experience. The yeah, fun. well, and we were students; we were poor, so you know, like good yeah. be good beer for a dollar a bottle with you know eight hours of labor was totally worth it for sixty bottles. Absolutely. And so you know, that was like yeah, and so we'd always make these great batches, and then one time we're like, we should do this sober. Like, we're let's just not drink this time, and we'll, we'll do it. You know, sober, and we'll we'll get an even better batch. That was the worst batch we ever made. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was surprised. Like, I never knew, like the so when you're doing the when you're making bourbon, like the every I think I was pulling off um, samples like every five minutes or every ten minutes. I don't remember, but you'd have these glasses coming out of the still every ten minutes. And um, my wife's got a chemistry major, so right, oh, cool. you basically just light the stuff up coming out the beginning, and once it stops burning green and starts turning blue, then you know you got good alcohol. Oh, that's awesome! Um, so you, yeah, so you throw that everything above that away. Any green stuff goes away, and then you start like the collecting methanol. everything. But like literally every sample like has a little bit like it's a different alcohol percentage, but then they all have like a distinct smell. Oh, that's cool! And, and so. Then it gets down to the end where you're like, oh, you're supposed to blend this together. And I think that's where like the master like distillery comes in, where those guys like figure out how to blend, like what percentage of the the hot high end stuff you take versus the stuff towards the end starts to smell like a mossy, like old wet dog. But then occasionally <laughs> there'll be like a good smelling one in there and it like helps smooth it out. So it was this really interesting like experiment to try to blend all these things together to try to make something that actually tasted reasonable. But at the end, it turned out good. Like, That's it was awesome. good. Yeah. So it was a fun experience. It was just a lot of work. So it was a perfect COVID project when you had nothing to do. It was like, oh, let's just go make some bourbon. That sounds like a blast. Yeah. yeah I, I, made, I made face shields. <laughs> That's my one COVID project. Face shields. Yeah. Well, there was a team of us working on And they're actually, they're still working on it. There's a team of old EXO guys got together, and we were making a emergency ventilator, portable emergency ventilator. Oh, cool. Um, and so a bunch of, you know, X, XN existing XO engineers got together and, uh, put this thing together and, uh, they made a cool product. Like it's a little compact little unit. And I think that, I think it's, once they realized they didn't need, uh, ventilators, I think it's spiraled into like, a combining it with, a um, like a, uh, what's that? A portable CPR unit. So oh, interesting. You, if you. If you put the two together, right, the breathing with the the portable CPR unit. Have you ever seen one of those, like a power little chest compressor? No, I haven't seen that. Yeah, so you put those two together, and you can basically do automated CPR for somebody, like on a trip back to a hospital. Like if you had it in a in a um, uh, if you had it inside a uh, uh, ambulance. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that seems. Yeah. Uh, I'm told CPR is like harder than it looks. Like to get right, like you have to actually like. Yeah, break fortunately, the I never had to do it. So <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. yeah, I don't think I've never had it done on me yeah. or had to do it to anybody. Luckily. Yeah, but that's uh, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Do you uh, do you still keep in touch with many of the XO folks? Yeah, yeah. Oh, he's actually just down. Um, Nate's got a cool new company. We were down there like two weeks ago. It's called Loom, L-U-U-M. I've heard of these guys. What are they? What are they up to again? Eyelashes, robotic eyelashes. Oh, well, that's cool. Yeah. So we were down there the other day and got to see. I think they're, I think they're putting in their first commercial installation now any day, um, and it's super cool. They call it the grill in the box. You basically have these two Scaro robots up there, and the whole vision system, and it literally puts on and, and glues individual eyelashes. It scans complete machine vision. And you just lay there and it just, I think it takes like 30 something minutes and it, you get a whole set of individual lashes glued on. That's awesome. Um, yeah. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah it's that really actually cool, sounds really pretty cool idea. fun to work on technically too. Yeah. Yeah. I think they definitely had to solve some tough challenges. I mean, the one, the one nice thing is like you can have this big scare robot, right. That has a pretty big, payload capacity but the the actual thing that to, they're touching to put on little teeny eyelashes well, yeah well so they just need the positioning accuracy right um huh. but the uh the end effectors that actually touch the lash like the lash essentially weighs nothing yeah right <laughs> so they have these they have these end effectors that are um uh super dainty and so like if there's ever any like abnormality or anything happens they'll just collapse i, I got out of the way 
So like, there's oh, no risk. That's awesome. You're not going to poke someone's eye out. You're not going like, to be stabbed through the head with a robot or anything yeah. like horrific like that. Although even talking about it, it makes my eyes water for some reason. Ever since he brought it up, it makes my eyes water whenever I talk about having things there. I don't know why. I don't know. I mean, the idea of a scar robot going anywhere near my eye is a little bit terrifying. But like you said, the robot can't. Yeah, that's why they call it the gorilla in the box because the robots are like in a platform above you and only the end effectors come down. Oh, that's cool. So it's like I'm picturing like a cocktail straw, basically. No. Yeah. Yeah. So like imagine like so your question earlier, like ever see a robot run run through a wall. So like they have this thing like built in a box so even if that robot did run away it can't go anywhere yeah it makes um, sense yeah so it's awesome yeah, I, so, I did run a robot through a wall i think that was like a rite of passage at carnegie mellon so i made like this hole in the drywall in the in the student union it was done tele-op mode so i i drove it through <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's why we've been yeah. well these these solar robots that well they're machines but they're all uh they're all radio controlled. So it's like having a, it's like having a 30,000 pound remote control tractor. <laughs> <laughs> They're pretty fun. That sounds like a blast. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, uh, what are, what are some of the things you can do with one of those? Uh, that one's for putting the solar, uh, piles in. Oh, solar. So I'm sorry. Cus- yeah. I heard, yeah. I heard solar. For putting those solar trusses in. So it's, uh, it's 30, yeah, there's no pounds. <laughs> Yeah, there's no there's no cab on it. It's a big tracked vehicle that goes along rough terrain and um, puts these things in the ground. Uh, uh, the company's called Ojo. Ojo. Okay, cool. So yeah, it's pretty cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think I think we're probably at a good stopping point. Like I, think, I feel like we're hitting a good natural lull. If we go much longer, it's going to be a two hour app and no one's going to listen. There you go. So, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, anything you want to plug uh, on the way out the door? No, this has been fun, and it's always fun to just chat people i've had a blast i i I really enjoy talking to you russ um you know it's just good to meet someone else who enjoys building stuff and uh yeah this is a real pleasure yeah yeah no this has been fun it's it's always fun to bring up like old stories and old memories and then it reminds you to connect with some people that maybe you've lost touch with over time like i should give that guy a call i haven't talked to him in a while absolutely Talk (laughs) talk about all those failures we had and all those crazy stories I saw one of the BattleBots guys at a trade show in Boston uh, like a few months ago, and my immediate reaction was just to run up and give him a hug. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. It's like, oh, Jamo, how you been? Yeah. I mean, that's the one. That's the one weird thing about being out of the exoskeleton space is when you're when you're in that space. It maybe like for entrepreneurs, like you think the whole like everyone's paying attention, right? Like because you're living and breathing that that market or whatever you're doing whatever startup little niche you're in or segment and from your perspective right you think like everyone's paying attention and then you get outside of it and you realize like oh nobody's paying like like, i was paying attention like i followed x i was like i think i think i might have applied for like an internship with you guys after i finished grad school (laughs) oh really (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah. i've been been following you guys uh like since grad school always always was a fan of that company well, well, Nate's from Carnegie Mellon, so I'm surprised you didn't get it. We had a we had a couple guys from Carnegie Mellon there, and Katie, yeah. yeah. But they, that was the one cool thing about working. Like, if you work on a cool project, like we were able to attract some great talent. Like, people wanted to come work on stuff, and um, so that part was really fun. Like, we were never like lacking to find people that wanted to come play and um, work on that stuff. So that. That was a cool part of the project. So when you work on something cool, you get cool people to co- want to come work on it. I completely agree. There's there's one we're spinning up for now. And um, I, I sort of was rallying the troops this morning and just had an all hands to introduce everyone to everyone else. And uh, yeah. I, I don't know. I'm really proud of the group, even though we haven't done anything yet. Like, I think I think they're going to I think they're going to knock it out of the park. That's awesome. So, yeah. yeah. Cool projects yeah, for sure. All right. Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. 
SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.